Well, hello everyone and a very big welcome. Thank you so much for joining us to the Girls on Track UK evening. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be delving into the world of photography. And I'm so excited because we have two of the best in the business, Lou Johnson and Lara Platman here with us. And they're going to be telling us the, well, the ins and outs of it all, how they got started, the highs and the lows. We want we want to hear the, the you know, the, the good and the bad. Um, welcome guys. Uh, Lara, kick off with you. How are you? Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I'm so envious of your hot cross buns. I've had some Tunnock's tea cakes today. So I've started. Oh, good shout. Started with those. But um, no, I'm really well. I'm really looking forward to this evening. So thank you for having me. Oh, no. Thank you ever so much for joining us. And Lou in the house as well. How are you? Getting excited about Full Marie next week? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I haven't had any snacks today. What is this? <laughs> I can't believe that. Wow. Um, well, that's just because I've been busy. But um, thank you. Yes, I am looking forward to Formula E next week. Cannot wait to get back on track. It's going to be a great one. Yeah, I must say, looking at everyone's um, social media at the moment, everyone's gone out to the first extreme e-race and I am sitting at home feeling rather envious that I am not there, especially as I was going to go and then I stupidly thought it was a bad idea to go and be away for so long but anyway that's another story um <laughs> so let's get into how you both started in photography I think is probably a question um that everyone well there are so many different ways aren't there that you get started in photography um everyone has their own story um I would actually remind everyone that has joined us that if you do have any additional questions we have got um some of the questions that you emailed in before which we will work our way through over the course of the next hour but if uh, any additional questions spring to mind then please do use the Q&A function um there's there's two functions there's the chat function and the q a function if you can keep your questions in the q a function that'd be brilliant um but please also do feel free to use the chat as well and uh, obviously this is a great way this is a great way um for the community of budding photographers to all get to know each other so if you want to sort of have a chat about um and give opinions on what we're talking about then please do and we can get involved in that as well but any direct questions for lou and lara then use the q a function um, right. Well, in no particular order, but because it just makes sense, Lara, you're on my left, <laughs> going across my screen. Um, tell us, how did you first get into photography? What's your story? Well, I started really young, at a really young age. I started when I was about seven or eight. Um, wow. my, my father had a theatrical costume design business and he always used to take his own photographs in a dark with, a, with film in a dark room. So I always used to help him print in the dark room. So I learned really, really early on how magic developing pictures were. And so wow. as a child, I was always in the dark room. And then it was kind of automatic that I would do it at school and at O level and at A level. And then I did a foundation, then I did a degree. And it was just. It was just how it was. It was automatic. I was always going to be a photographer. Not sure in what sort of field, how my, my ideas and projects would, would progress and transcend, but that was, that was how I was going to be. <laughs> there was no, I didn't wow. know what else I was going to be. I was also very interested in music, but then I thought, well, I'm not going to be in a band. I don't really want to be in an orchestra. Um, I love playing the piano, but I didn't want to perform. So it was photography. And, I, and also, as I was taking photographs, I was thinking, have camera, can travel. Amazing. What? So that's incredible because you, well, you obviously, you got the call from a young age. You knew you were heading in that direction and, and didn't. And have you ever done, have you ever thought, oh, was this the right direction for me? Or you just knew you were on the right path? Well, you talk about highs and lows and photography takes a long time to, to, to mm. kick in. And there were so many times where I was thinking I should be doing something else. But all my other jobs, my part time jobs, the other contract jobs, picture editing, picture researching, archival assistant in a photo library, um, account director in a photo library, photo agent. So all my other peripheral contracts was always photography. Wow. So um, 
either practically taking photographs or the sidelines, administrative side or the editorial side. It was always that thing. And I still now think of it and think, well, what else, what else would I have done? It was sort of automatic. There was no, and I just, it, it grew into my, my blood. It was just always going to be how it happened. And I never thought of anything else. That's amazing. That's what that's that's wonderful. So you obviously clearly are definitely in the right role. <laughs> um, and your, I mean, your focus, obviously, one of your passions is motorsport, and that is very much, you know, part of your photography. But um, it's not just motorsport, is it? No. So before I really started doing a lot of motorsport, I was doing a lot of portraiture and theatre. And I worked for a magazine called Country Life magazine. I did a lot of their theatre work. And then 20, oh, it sounds, I've just got my age out there. But 20 years ago, they sent me to the first Goodwood revival. Oh. And for the theatre, for the theatre. And I came away with motorsport and that was that. Poof. It's amazing how quickly you can fall in love with motorsport, isn't it? <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, I mean, the smells, the, the women, the men, the cars, the stories, the camaraderie, the, the, the group, the community. Wow, it was just that was another automatic. So I sort of then pursued doing a lot more motorsport, but always with the portraiture and the theatre very much as a backbone of it. Yeah, but that's the brilliant thing about motor racing, isn't it? It is this dramatic stage. It's always set to this fantastic backdrop. There's always an incredible story. You never know, you never know how the story is going to be played out. That's the tough part, though, which we'll come on to later. How you manage to find those stories and always be in the right place at the right time, which I never know. <laughs> um, Lou, let's hear about how you first got started in, in photography. I mean, obviously, we're very lucky, uh, or well, I'm lucky, to get to work with you on a fairly regular basis, thanks to Formula E. Um, but yeah, what's your story into photography? Um, so I think I've always had a camera. Like, there's lots of pictures of me with, I've got, I, I've still got it. It's like a tiny little camera. It's pink and it's got a little caterpillar on it. And I've had it since I was like, <laughs> like two or something. Like, always had it. And I was about, like just been an interest and I've always been quite arty and kind of into sort of doing stuff and making things and uh I was at school so maybe 13 14 and a friend of mine had been gifted like a learn to use your cameras sort of workshoppy thing in someone's right. like house or something and she was like I don't want to go alone can you come with me and I was like sure I'll come that's fine and I don't think anyone quite thought I would come away being like oh this is can I do this again so I started like taking pictures of random things that I was going to motorsport was already sort of like a thing I was loving anyway so I was like oh I'll bring my camera to this event and like do it a bit more properly and and then it sort of all just sort of fell into place really uh a levels sort of came around I'd already done some like GCC a GCC at this point in photography and a level in photography and it was sort of do I do psychology which is a massive kind of kind of real pull for me or do I do photography and there was just this point of well I don't I sort of want to go to university so I don't really know what I'm going to do now what do I just do I just sort of just assume that I'm just going to be a photographer sort of in my spare time or do I really go for it and I really went for it and I'm really happy I did <laughs> like I was like I could try maybe do psychology if I get to 25 and I've completely failed I can't take anything and I can't I don't like it then, then there's a bit more time there's not got commitments or anything maybe and um and yeah then I met the most incredible people at university I became the person I wanted to be I think I just was very lucky with the people I met and just went oh I'll just give it a go <laughs> and I came out of university similarly to Laura actually I worked in a theatre so all of my side jobs were things that I loved doing so kind of working as a theatre like as a theatre photographer but also running a theatre at points and and doing all these different things I was always really kind of attracted to that sort of kind of storytelling um and then and then yeah I managed to get a job within motorsport photography about season two Formula E so when was that that was like four years ago or something and I haven't left since <laughs> just oh, been there and done more and more motorsport and sort of just there's just many things on my bucket list of like things I want to do and sports and it's all about telling the story and things that I love so I sort of get it into my head oh, I want to go and shoot them all or whatever and it's like okay gotta make that happen how do I make that happen how do I push for this and who do I get who do I, who do I need to know and stuff so yeah just go with what my heart says because then you make 
better images. So interesting. So you both went down that, you know, got the proper qualifications, as I'm sure um, we will discover, but, you know, whether or not that I'm sure there are some people um, who are listening or watching, debating whether, you know, going to university and doing a photography um, degree is essential. Um, do you have photography, photographer friends who maybe haven't gone down the traditional route? Um. Most of my photography, oh, shall I start? Most of my yeah. photography friends. So I'm just going to apologise. I can hear my child screaming. So apologies <laughs> if you can hear him in the background. Um, He's okay. My, um, a lot of my photography friends all went and did a photographic diploma or a degree or a qualification. Um, some of the friends who call themselves amateur photographers took it up as a part-time, as a pastime, but don't really want to make a, a living at it. But all the people I know who do want to make a living at it went and did a qualification. And it's not literally just taking the picture, it's all the stuff around taking the picture. Um, and, and Lou, you were mentioning about psychology. I mean, at, at photography school, you learn about psychology and neuro-linguistic programming and all the stuff about where to look and how the light comes and affects a picture. And Because the actual picture is just 125th of a second of the actual event. The mm -hmm. rest of it is all the stuff that happens beforehand. And so I think it's really good to have an education to, to learn what all that stuff is that happens before taking the picture. And um, also, sorry, just to say, it, um, oh, the, the fact that also you listed off so many roles within photography, it's a bit like, you know, in motorsport, we always talk about there are so many different jobs. It's not just a racing driver and his engineer and that's it. <laughs> There's thousands of different jobs. It's clearly the same. You know, I'm very naive. I don't know a huge amount about the world of photography. I know the photographers. <laughs> But then there's so many other jobs behind the scenes as well, of course. Um, I was just going to say, actually, a lot of the people. So for anyone who's sort of debating, oh, do I have to go and do a degree or kind of do I have to go through formal education? You don't. Um, a lot of people who I know within kind of the Formula E pit lane, some of them have done things like graphic design um, and like degrees and stuff. Some people haven't even finished their degree. They've kind of done it for a little bit and gone, gone actually, I can do this self-driven. I want. I want to go and pursue this and there's quite a lot of other people who haven't done a degree at all they've been completely self-taught they've just got out there they've taken pictures and things like that so if you have the motivation it depends on what you what's best for you as an individual so there's no with any creative thing or with any most job roles you have to be doing what's right for you to properly be at your creative peak so if education like formal education is not for you then you can get yourself like a mentorship or you can kind of like try and assist someone and work your way up that way. So don't worry if that's not necessarily, if you, like just because Lara and I have both done a similar thing, it's not the only the yeah. only one. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, I was thinking it, it's, I mean, just because I know a lot of people who have gone for that formal education, it might be to do with age as well. We had a different scenario when we were studying. We, we didn't have student loans, we had grants, you know. So it's a whole different setup now as well. Um, I do think though, if you don't do a, a, a degree or a formal education, it's really, really, really good to do some classes though, some, some assisting, some apprenticeships, some classes, go to some groups and clubs and, and join some places where you are all, learning from each other because it's that inspiration and that learning facility that develops your own internal mm -hmm. photography skills yeah yeah and it might help you to develop those skills quicker as well you know um, if you have that sort of expert advice along the way. Um, now, we do have lots of questions. Um, some of them are quite technical questions <laughs> about what lens to use, etc. So that's going to go right over my head, but we're not here for that purpose. <laughs> so apologies for any silly questions that I ask, because I am not a photography <laughs> expert. <laughs> um, and then uh, probably once we've gone through a couple of these questions, we've actually got some photos that um, Lou and Lara have picked, some of their proudest works, I would say, and some beautiful images. And we'll sort of talk through sort of the specifics um, about those particular images and maybe the story behind it and how it came about and a few technicals um, 
of those images. Um, but first, let's talk about the sort of the job itself, because one of the questions is from Teresa. Um, and Teresa would like to know what the most challenging part of your job is and how stressful it can get. <laughs> but I feel like before we maybe talk about the most challenging part, we should talk about the most rewarding part and what is it that you have fallen in love with? You know, what is it about photography and your job that you absolutely love the most? Um, and then followed by what's the most challenging and uh, how do you cope with those stressful moments? <laughs> um, so shall I start again? Because yeah, like, yeah. yeah. um, there's two <laughs> things that I find equally as rewarding that I find equally as just brilliant the first thing is being on set being in the moment taking the photograph that just completely gives you a, a high an endorphin that you cannot explain it if you're not doing it it's just amazing taking the photograph finding the photograph getting the moment finding that precise moment the other equal thing for me is smelling the ink when a picture gets published in a magazine or a newspaper or a book blows my head it's lovely <laughs> smelling the ink and just seeing is it from China Italy did it get printed in England and then the picture's there and you can't see your own picture because you're smelling the ink that also <laughs> blows my head as well I love that so when okay so when you're in the moment and you have you know it, you're there in that instant you're like this is it are there ever moments where you're like this is it I think I've taken an awesome photo and then you look at it and you're like oh well, that wasn't quite as good as I thought it was. <laughs> I don't I don't look at my pictures when I'm doing it, partly because um, if you're in a pit lane, Lou, you know, if you're in a pit yeah, lane, you're not really allowed to business. look down at your camera because you get told to go to the headmaster. You're not allowed to look down and chimp at your back of your camera. You just have to take pictures. So I shoot like I'm shooting film still, so I don't know what I've taken. Yeah, okay. But yeah, you do know. You do know. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Whereas sometimes I have moments, and this is important to know if anyone is like, because I didn't think that anyone else did this and I thought I was a rubbish photographer. I have moments where I'll be in the garage and I'll be shooting and I'll come out and there'll be a moment, like a great moment. And I'll be like, yes, there's my driver coming towards me with my someone else and this is great shot and they're the championship rivals or something. And I'll take a photo and I'll look at my camera and I'll be like, damn it, I had the wrong settings because I was in the garage and the garage is really dark. Damn it. <laughs> didn't think because I work with the moment and that's great so there are some times I when like it Luke. Sort of, you sort of lose the moment and I once said that to someone in the media center and I was like oh damn it like do you sometimes get like times like that and they went yeah it's normal and I was like oh, okay I'm not rubbish just <laughs> it's just normal it's fine so yeah, yeah like there are really rewarding moments like that um and I love like there is nothing nicer then for me, like the moment is when everything, all the stars align, you've got really cloudy sky or something. And then all of a sudden there's just this ray of light and it's just beautiful. And it just lights everything and it makes it look so dramatic and you get the shot. There's that buzz that Laura just said that just kind of, that you can't, you can't replace that. Like there's, I can, you know, I love cooking. I can make a great meal. It's not the same. Like yeah. it's, there's just, you don't get that in your stomach of like, oh, that's so exciting. Like, and I've done shoots before where I'll run around, I'll start skipping and stuff like that. If it's, you know, safe to do so, not in a life pit lane, please don't kick me out FIA. Like, um, <laughs> but there are like several moments where there's just points where you can't, the, just the adrenaline that you get from being able to tell that story correctly, or just, it looks so beautiful because everything's sort of falling into place and yeah. And, and then you tell someone about the amazing experience you've just had and they're they're concentrating on their job and they just look at you and think what why have you just talked to me about that for and they're really concentrating they're sort of sorting out all their stuff you know they're in their zone and you've just come out of your zone going oh my god that was just brilliant and they're going good good for you yeah <laughs> it's very true, actually. Everyone, you know, again, in most, everyone's sort of, you know, particularly in race mode, it's like, we've all got jobs to do. You've got to really focus. And then you come out and talk to someone in their, in their own little world as well. <laughs> um, well, that's, yeah, I think you kind of tick the most, um, well, I suppose the best part and, and the most stressful part at once there. <laughs> well, I, this, I think for me, the most stressful part is all the stuff that happens before the picture. You know, when if you in motorsport, if you do go to Le Mans, um, the stressful part is all the tape, the red tape 
there's a lot of paperwork and you've got to go to the press briefings and you've got to have all the right equipment and you've got to be there at the right time and if you're not there at the right time you can't get your uh, your your ban your ballard and and it's not up to you and they suddenly change the times because of something else has happened and and you get there and it's not in that building it's in another building and it's going to take you 20 minutes to get there and then if you it, that's all the stuff that happens in my head going oh my god and you're carrying all this kit with you and you've done 12 miles before you've even started the race and you just think whoa and that's stressful <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a good point. So Rome is a really good example. We're just going out to Rome. COVID has changed that protocol a lot for, for us. Um, so in order to go out, you've got a lot more boxes to tick. It's all of these things that allow you to do your job. But there's a massive thing, especially at the moment, I just want to go do my job. Like I've had a whole year of not having much, like taking pictures of cars and stuff. And as petty and as stupid as that sounds, that's what makes me tick. That's why I'm still here and I've got through everything because... I really love it like I really do and um and then when you've got like more and more red tape and I've got like 12 forms to take with me just to get on my plane just in case anything happens and then that's in someone else's control and you're trying to make sure that you've got everything and that you're as prepared as possible but also with Rome we've got a brand new racetrack like all parts of it are new so I'm trying to prepare myself mentally for kind of going to do a track walk but how can I prepare myself properly for that and make sure I'm getting the best out of everything when I'm there but am I even going to get there because there's all of this thing and I've got to take a COVID test and what, what I'm happens if I you fail that to- <laughs> <You're sorry. laughs> like what happens if I become positive like I haven't left the house for weeks but like mm-hmm. it's all these things that really stress me out at the moment and it's just ultimately it's worth it because the moment I stand in the pit lane it's like oh and do you think, because, you know, it, 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 it is stressful, particularly, obviously, um, the world of, not all the time, but photography, you can be freelance. So you're not necessarily always part of a big, bigger team. Um, so you're very much self-sufficient. Um, you know, it comes down to you. You've got to look after yourself. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts, you know, particularly with overseas travel, as you mentioned, you know, there are so many visas and passes and whatnot getting yourself from A to B. Um, but do you think sort of, does that just come with experience? Cause you know, I'm sure some people would find that whole thing quite stressful. Um, and does wow. it just get easier mm. with experience? No. Well, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm freelance and the first time I went to Le Mans I hitchhiked and um, on Twitter so I tweeted out and said <laughs> awesome. can, some, can someone take me to Le Mans and a load of people replied and I had to sort of vet them thinking how how dodgy are they <laughs> you know um, I got myself to Le Mans, which was brilliant. And then I hitchhiked back again. So that was really good. And I slept in a container with a Ferrari car that was in the classic pits. So I slept underneath the Ferrari, which had a drip. And they, it was just dripped on me. But it was a, an expensive drip because it was a Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase. So it was a good expensive drip. Oh, but, right. Okay. Yeah. And it, and it was raining one that year. One of the most expensive. <laughs> so, I was, so I was sleeping underneath this dripping Ferrari um, during the day because I wanted to shoot at night. Um, and another time I, I hitchhiked again through Twitter. Twitter's amazing. Um, to Spa 24 hours. And I camped um, by myself somewhere. Um, and, and yeah, that was interesting because I'd left some of my stuff in the tent knowing that it might not be there when I get back. So some of it was in the press room in the locker and, and some clothes and things were in the tent, but everything was there. Oh. And, <laughs> you know, and it's great. Um, and then I, I also got myself to the Monaco historic, um, the Monte Carlo historic um, rally. Yeah. Um, and I hired a, a hire car um, and did the reconnaissance and did the press in a hire car. So yeah, there's lots of um, ways of doing it. And you just think, well, I'm just, you just got to go and try. And then you get invited and you get to be with teams afterwards if you make your headway and your work proves your worth, I suppose. But it, yeah. do, it does get easy. So I'm also freelance and it does get easy. It's terrifying. The first time I went, I had to get to Punta del Este in Uruguay. Never even heard of Punta del Este. And I had to get there on like three different like flights and a bus or something. And it's the sort of thing that when you're sat back at home, you think, oh, my goodness. But you sort of get into the swing of it. You sort of as you as you go through airports, you learn how you 
you know, where you put your passport, even if you're already knackered, your passport lives in that pocket. So it doesn't matter how like jet lagged you are, you know where things are. So you sort of get used to it. Talk to people if you're doing that and you suddenly are a bit scared about how to do it. Everyone has their own systems and some of them will work for you and some of them don't. So the best thing I ever did was talk to some of the people who've done it for longer and then just sort of like adjust to how they're doing it and then adjust it to my way. But yeah, it can be very overwhelming and that's completely natural. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. It's a weird thing to do. I guess it's really important to try once you're working in the world of uh, sort of photography, whichever industry, or you just get yourself involved in that community and hope you help each other out <laughs> it's I mean motorsport is such a great community um and if you go to an event like Le Mans that community is amazing or the Nurbo 24 hours that's an amazing connected lot of yeah. people and social media at the moment is fantastic so everyone knows where you are and looks after you. I was I was shooting um in the night time at the Nurburgring and the, the lovely Radio Le Mans team said text us in every hour please just to check that you're still walking around and fine. And mm -hmm. also there was no cameras, um, television cameras at nighttime for Nebo 24 hours. So I was texting in broken down cars in the Adenau forest, you You're know. You're doing so for them, brilliant. I'm a reporter for them. I love it. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna have to get to the questions, aren't I? Cause we're gonna run out of time because there's so many. Um, this is a big question. Uh, Reem would like to know, how can I improve myself in photography so I can maximize my chances of working in Formula One or for a Formula One team? Lou. <laughs> um, so to, Where to one, start. <laughs> yeah, it's a there's no one way into any any line of any line of motorsport. We've spoken about kind of how you can develop as a photographer, but there just isn't everyone has their own story. So I came in through hospitality photography. That was the first thing I did in Paris and uh, London season two in uh, Formula E. I did, I did hospitality and from the Emotion Club, I was shooting bits of the cars, but my main job, the reason I was paid to be there was the hospitality. Um, I learned how to take pictures of cars on the main road that's next to my house. As the cars came past, I was panning. It's just whatever, and I didn't have a great camera and I was just learning their techniques. So the best thing you can do from my experience and from talking to people who are already like in the industry and stuff is just keep practicing. So go to events, take photos. Like most of the time when I go to a racetrack, British racetracks, I'm in the fan zones, like the fan areas. You don't have to have accreditation and be trackside to do that. You can, you will gain sort of more kind of, kind of, esteem if you like if you can take some wicked shots that show the event show the story of the event that you're there but also kind of some cool like panning through the the, the trees that might be there or people kind of people can tell if you can take a picture being closer to the cars of a car kind of, car kind of in the frame like you don't have to be that side of the catch fence you can create some amazing images you don't have to have the best cameras I had a lens that after I kind of it, it would do like it was 7300 Sigma, like 5.6, I think it was, which meant that it would get to like 200 mil and then just lose all focus. That fluffy, just fluffy, horrible images. <laughs> so I wasn't really, I'd never had like a telephoto lens. And my main workhouse now, workhorse lens now is a 7200. So you don't need these big telephoto lenses that cost thousands and thousands of pounds if you can't afford them just keep practicing develop your own style send images to people so go for kind of tuition if you can if that's the sort of thing for you or send us emails it's quite a lot of motorsport photographers who remember what it's like <laughs> when we were trying to start out and we will absolutely if we've got the time reply to some emails some instagrams whatever keep going people can't employ you if you're not visible so make sure that you've got an instagram or a twitter or something because i've had so much work from Instagram and I barely post on Instagram I'm getting better but I barely post on Instagram it's just important that you have some sort of presence to get into a Formula One team I would never say that that should be your only aim work from the bottom up but also embrace other parts of motorsport too there's a lot of red tape in Formula One especially at the moment with Covid there's a lot of other smaller kind of club racing championships and stuff where you can still develop your skills develop who you are what you are like when I started out, I really wanted to do kind of 
Formula One, and then I started shooting WEC and Formula E, and now I can't, I can't not in my head do endurance stuff and and Formula E stuff. They're both similar in a way because they have sessions at different times of the day. So you can choose that you can work with the light, you have that kind of challenge. They kind of travel around the world and stuff. Whereas Formula One is often set, often set to one o'clock, two o'clock race times. So the light's very similar, it's quite harsh. There are amazing photographers in Formula One, but I mean, I worked for Mahindra Racing in Formula E and I, the, the amount of stuff that we can do together is just incredible and I love every minute of it. So I'm a, ra I'm a race team photographer, but I'm not a race team photographer in Formula One. So yeah, it make sure you're- You have more sort of flexibility and versatility and you're yeah. quite creative among, you know, you're, you're always putting forward ideas and it's very much a, a yes team, isn't it? Yes, yeah, very much. Um, there was, you mentioned about your favourite lens, because it just brings us on to another question from Kenneth, um, who asks, what is your favourite lens for photography in the pits? Ah, my recommendation. Mine <laughs> is a, uh, mine's an F1 Noctilux. It's a Leica F1 Noctilux, which means it's, um, so Nikki, it's, got a really 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 wide open aperture okay. and so say you're at night and you walk around your eyes are really really open and everything behind you is blurred but one of the things is really in focus it's got a great depth of field and I love that 50 mil oh, so I can see my cat walking out <laughs> in the room. Um, it's a it's a 50 mil noctilux because I shoot with Leica um I don't have a, a zoom a, a two, a 70 to 200 my biggest my longest lens is a 135 which was made in 1977 so it's a really really old mm -hmm. lens it's really heavy as well but um my favorite is a noctilux f1 um lens and my uh, my second favorite is my 75 1.4 Fantastic. Again, um, wide. I really like wide, big depth of field. I, be, I get a bit frightened shooting above 2.8, which is a, you know, quite wide. <laughs> Me too. And it's really sunny. It's like, oh no, what am I doing? So I'm going to do similar. So mine's a 50 mil Sigma, um, 1.4 Sigma art lens. Lovely. Similar thing, just a very, just new in comparison. Uh, and then my 7200 because, um, so I always have two cameras on me. I've got one sort of that I can do kind of more arty stuff and then one that will just cover everything that I need to be able to cover kind of a, a more reportage point of view for kind of I have clients in uh, the race team but also um, like a journalistic sort of uh, client called the race and lots of other things as well you need to try I, I have a lot of things in my head at the same time I'm it's very rare that I can concentrate on it just being arty if I could just do arty and that was all I could do then I'd have an 80 mil 1.4 probably and a 50 mil 1.4 just have the two but it takes a lot of confidence yeah. for me to just have prime lenses because I get a bit scared so I'm like oh I probably should have a backup just in case <laughs> you can zoom lens <laughs> well I have I have it. I have the two cameras and they're both both have prime on so if I'm shooting um in the pits I have one at a 50 or the 75 but then one at a 35 but my favorite is the the 50 and if it's in the daytime I shoot with the 135 because it's so old and heavy you can't have it with any bad light you need a really good sunny day because you've got to stand there and you just get rid of your wet washing rings when you're standing there taking that picture because it's enormous lens um and you get really good muscles using it um, <laughs> work at the same time <laughs> work out yeah <laughs> well we do actually have some of your favorite photos that you've taken and that I mentioned earlier so I think now's probably a good time to get them up on screen and then perhaps you can um talk us through a little bit about each photo okay so first up uh we have Okay, so Laura, this is a favorite moment of yours from shooting. Um, so just, oh, wow. I mean, this is just such a beautiful moment, isn't it? Oh, I can I can feel the atmosphere. I can feel the, the rain in my hair just from looking at that picture. And um, talk us through when this was taken. So this is at Spa six hours. Uh, it starts at six o'clock at night and finishes at midnight. Driver change, Porsche 904, Mr. Eve June. Sadly, he's not around with us anymore. Um, 
but he was the president of the Automobile Club France and of Mottle Oil. He, he ran Mottle Oil. And mm. he's racing there with Shamrock Racing. Um, and it's a driver change. Uh, they're sorting out the wheels as well. You can see someone bending over just at the back there. He's getting out. And it's shocking it down yeah. with rain. <laughs> but um, I, I love it because it's such a cinematic moment. And it really does catch one minute in time, one, one 25th of second time. That's shot with my Noctilux. It's shot at um, 1.4, which is very wide. So you just get a, you just get his face, his arm and the door in focus. The 31 is blurred. The man in front on the right hand side is completely blurred. And you just bring right your attention into his face. And the light is literally from some of the lights in the ceiling. No flash. Mm. Um, and it just took seconds to take. But you have to hang out there and wait and be patient. Just be patient. You know it's happening. Just go wait for it to happen. It, it, as you say, it's so cinematic, isn't it? It's just absolutely beautiful. I mean, it, it films like it's off like a movie set. It's so perfect. <laughs> you know, like you've just stopped a moment in time. It's incredible. Um, but how long, how much work do you have to put in to getting a moment like that? So, you know, um, you hang out with the garage, you hang out, you walk the pit lane and you find out who um, you can take photographs of. I was actually hanging out in the next door garage because I was invited by them, but then this, um, started up a brilliant relationship for, I don't know, for like the next 10 years with, with these teams. But um, you, you wait there and you know when they're doing their, their pit changes. There's a six hour race and there's three drivers. So, and it's raining. So they're coming in quite a lot. So they're coming in every hour, really. So you just wait there for the hour that they're coming in. You're in the dry, you've got to keep out the way. Um, and you set it up, you, because I'm using manual focus, manual exposure everything has to be set up beforehand you don't want to start faffing around with your camera whilst the driver change is happening because you'll lose it mm -hmm. so you set everything up you get the light you focus on a pebble your pebble is your best friend for the like 45 minutes of life and you, you look <laughs> at the pebble and you check out how bright your pebble is um and then suddenly there's a whole car and a person on top of it and you've got the right light and the right focus yeah so you make friends with the most stupid piece of tarmac. Okay, well, that's a good tip for everyone. <laughs> Befriend the tarmac. Right, Lou, let's take a look at your favorite moment from shooting. I mean, wow. Uh, talk us through this one. So this, so I, I shoot from Mahindra Racing. So this was, this was my team. So for me, there's a point where you always want to get the story that, that, an image that tells the story of the race for your client, but also for everybody as well. So this was uh, Mexico a couple of years ago. Pascal Verline um, was leading the, 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 the race. Um, it, Mexico is just insane. <laughs> just as just generally being there, it's just insane. This is a massive stadium complex and all of that blur you can see at the front or the top, that there's people. It's, I mean, it's a COVID nightmare, but it's, it's lovely. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and uh, and Pat, this was the last kind of closing laps of the race. And um, Lucas de Grassi is kind of just in that car that you can see, just going around the corner and he's he's chasing down Pascal. It's really close. And um, and I just wanted to get that atmosphere and that just kind of thrill of the chase. And you kind of watch these things um, kind of pan out over the race, like before and it's 45 minutes. So you, it can change really, really, really quickly. So you might have what feels like the best shot ever. And it really tells the story of the race. And then within seconds, it will change. So actually, this is one of those moments. So I got this shot and I was like, yes, got my driver winning the race. P2 person chasing him down. You can see just how close it is. And I've got like blur in the front of them. That's the other cars kind of coming around. And I'd nailed like a, I can't tell you the specifications, but I think it was like a tenth of a second pan. Like, took ages and ages to sort of set up I just had the shot in my head and then from here I ran into the garage where it transpired <laughs> that my my driver Pascal had run out of energy I think at that point and 
and literally the last seconds of the race was he lost he lost the win so I ran into the garage being like yes I'm gonna get some celebration shots this is amazing I've got the whole story this is absolutely stunning I've just nailed this this is the best thing ever and that massive euphoria and then all of a sudden everyone in the garage is not not, not celebrating anymore and I'm like what's going on and then I looked at the screen and then I realized what had happened oh um, it was just everything <laughs> but for me this is all, this is my favorite mo- moment shooting for me three because I had just this shot this a shot in my in my head before it even started the race of how do I show the thrill of the race the the fans everything that is the Mexico Epre. And, yeah. and I managed to get the shot. It didn't actually sum up who won the race, um, which was a bit of a shame, but it happens. It's just, it's, it's motorsport, but it is still one of my favorite moments. But it, it shows that, you know, Pascal Fallon was the fastest driver at a point for most of the race. At a point, yeah, <laughs> you always want to take a photo with your team ahead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there is actually a question, which is probably, um, applies here. I'd love to know, this is from Sarah, I'd love to know the best combination of settings that you use for clear shots that still gives the effect of movement, e.g. while panning. So the best thing I can say with panning um, is to start one fiftieth of a second. It's quite an easy pan. It's not, it's nothing. You just have to get used to the motion. So a good example is me coming back into the pit lane in December, having not shot race cars for most of the year. I, when I'm sort of in the rhythm of it, when I know the cars, when I'm doing back to back races, I can sort of start off at something like maybe an 80th of a second and then work my way down. If I know that if I'm, if I'm, you know, midway through a day, I might be able to start at like a 15th and kind of go even slower. But you have to basically just get into the rhythm it and just keep kind of panning and panning throughout the day sometimes. Um, so I would say, like I used to when I was stood outside uh, in my drive, 250th of a second, just literally just getting used to it and then just slowly bring it down and slowly get used to it. And then if you don't quite nail the shot, you don't quite nail it and get the cri- get crisp, go back up again, mm-hmm. make it faster and then just keep just, just slowly down because there are some times like we're a bit competitive, uh, in motorsport it happens even photographers are competitive and I was in Saudi I was stood during the race and a photographer next to me went how slow can you pan let's have a pan off and I was like right done challenge accepted <laughs> so yeah, then I started at, uh, yeah and then I started at a 20th and we were like right you've got two laps and then we've got to get on and do some other stuff and I was like right I started at a 20th and I nailed it and I was like it's a night race so I was I'm not shot a night race so I was like right I'm gonna do a 20th and then I'm gonna do a fifth sod it next time to next time round, and you can get some shots like this like this helps when you've got something in the foreground as well but it's just yeah we we ended up kind of having a bit of like a couple couple more laps than we thought we should and then we went okay we have to go and do something else but it, it's a lot of fun and sometimes having that competition with yourself of I've done this slow before I wonder if I can make it slower actually sort of helps you raise your game with it so there isn't a specific way the, the best thing I would say is start kind of literally follow the car. So if you want the car to be in this part of your frame, follow the car from here, press the shutter and keep going because it's the movement and it's following the car that helps you get that crisp. But it's also not just moving the top of your body and your arms, it's actually moving from your hips. It's like playing playing golf So and playing tennis. So there's no point in just moving and stopping because it's just going to be blurred, not panned. So you've got to actually you know, do a bit of yoga and hippie hip movement. Can you actually sway with your body? And that's half of the panning scenario, actually going with it. Otherwise you just cut off the shot and it looks like it doesn't work. Yeah. Love it. I, I, this is fascinating. I never knew there was so much to it. Um, okay, let's have a look at, Laura, your greatest challenge. <laughs> so the challenge here is it's 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, we've got some um, lights in the car park. It's Valence. It's the Mon- Monte Carlo Historic Grand Prix. We've got Rana Alton and one of the Flying Finns. Um, and he happily, he, I was shooting and he said, he, he, he waved and waved and said, do you want me to turn my map light on? And I was like, yes. So I've got his map light lighting up his face. But apart from that, it's pitch black, absolutely pitch black. Um, 
you've got the lights in the you know the, the parking lot but they're so yellow and insignificant so his map light happens um it's also raining or sleet sleeting and um but the challenge was not just the photograph the challenge was being com co you know compassmentous at 3 a.m in the morning um <laughs> in the freezing cold wearing your half mitten gloves being there how many thermals are you wearing and can you move your arms because you've got so many thermals on um and you've also got your backpack on so you're kind of loaded up you're cold you've got to be really on it and all the drivers are raring to start their their session and the driver says do you want me to put the map light on and bingo so the challenge is all encompassing it's not literally just taking the picture it's it's everything around it the biggest challenge was getting from where i was staying to the car park at three in the morning because I wasn't staying quite near I was in somewhere else you've got to get there and you think oh my god it's 2 45 they're going to go at three go, go, go. Go. yeah <laughs> the distance. time of the morning um but yeah so that's a challenge that was a that was a really big challenge and the photograph comes out all smiling you don't oh, even know it was a challenge no. well this is the thing it's the beauty it hides all the the craziness that, that goes on behind the scenes to get there oh it's beautiful yeah Lou let's have a look at uh, at your greatest challenge wow look at that one so um it doesn't look like well I mean maybe it doesn't look like it's a challenge I don't I all I see with this image is the stress that <laughs> I had like maybe a week or so because like both, both obviously Lara can oh. see what's going on behind the scenes and obviously it's the same with you <laughs> so <laughs> like um different story. I, I got told by my my race team uh we're gonna, we need you to delivery shoot. We've booked the studio, we've booked everything. Um, are you happy to do that? We, we thought we'd do something different. We bought some fiber optic cables. Uh, we trust you. And I was like, uh huh, huh, yeah. At this point, I have done lots of studio photography, lots of studio photography, never with a car at this point, never with a car, never had a car, let alone for a client that is a regular client for me, let alone someone that says, I trust you. <laughs> I'm like, Okay, um, and I used to, and I still do product photography, which is um, of a different scale, um, <laughs> quite considerably. Um, and, uh, and this particular shot, so we'd done lots of different shots with the fiber optics. And at this point throughout the day, it was a really long day. This, I think it's like 6 p.m. or something. And I knew that I needed to still do this, this shot. And I knew it was the last sort of one I had planned. And I'd sort of had this idea in my head and the day before I'd had these fiber optic cables and I was pulling them over the, the, my bed in my hotel room, trying to sort of understand how they would move, sort of camera settings and stuff. And I, I sort of had an idea, but I was sort of going with the whole, I will know what looks right when I, when I get it. And I knew that it would be a composite image. So this is a composite image about three or four different frames. And uh, it was the last one we did. I wasn't quite happy with the, with our, like, everything else throughout the shot. Like throughout the shoot, I sort of felt like I'd got everything, but it, there wasn't just that like, yes, happy can can close the door sort of thing on this shoot. So I just sort of managed to persuade everyone if we could just have the car for a couple more minutes and I can only just do this. And uh, and then and then I got I got this, <laughs> and it was the biggest challenge I probably had at that point sort of going from I'm not really sure what I'm going to do to to creating this image um and I'm actually quite proud of it because uh it was just something that was quite different but also it sort of proved to me that I can just I should just trust my my kind of instincts a little bit and it's it's going to be all right and just keep keep working to what feels your heart like kind of what you feel like works in your heart like it's it was a very out of comfort zone sort of uh time for me but actually like yeah that was my biggest well, it paid off yeah but I'm sure it can be very difficult particularly if you've got the client there as well you know and you want to be mindful of the time and no one wants to finish late and everyone wants to get home for time for their tea but yeah. you you know yeah <laughs> stick at it work harder stay later um and then I'm just gonna let's very quickly just have a quick look really just um just to see these photos because I just want to get through to the last um, questions because they're so beautiful we can we couldn't miss them off um I mean this just again there's just so it's so atmospheric and cinematic this photo Lara it just is just beautiful with this 
smoke in the air and oh okay very quickly talk us through this <laughs> so again we're in a pit lane i mean i'm um you've seen for the last three photographs um, various forms of pit lane again it's far six hours and i i wanted to just show the same sort of um similarities of of, of the different reasons for shooting in one place um but the this the car came in it blew off it didn't go out again um, but now it races a lot. So what I love about that is the cars get rebuilt. They get rebuilt. You don't know what's going to happen in an endurance race. They could stay in the pit lane for two hours or three hours and they come out and they could come third and they can come on a podium. This car's raced a million times more and it keeps winning. It keeps winning all the time. It just, it did blow up in this in this photograph, but it does win in other photo in, in other photographs. Yeah. <laughs> the, the outcome as well, in the sense that it is in the black, and the only things that are being lit are the headlights and other lights from behind and other shots. So it's just all natural lighting. And I just love the smoke. It just was so evocative and it becomes a, a, again a cinematic piece. And um, that's why it was my favorite outcome because it joins up some of my work it makes a style and that's why I liked it because I was beginning to find my own niche my own style let's let's talk about that because you know photographers do find their own style and you know you once you get to know a certain style of photographer you can spot their images how um hard is it to find your style you know how did you come up with that do you have several different styles uh, you know depending on what you're shooting or is there a sort of general look that you try and always aim for well i think it's the equipment that you use as well it does sort of dictate the sort of photographs you can go for and you, you you're happy to go for um i mentioned earlier that i don't i rarely go above 2.8 when i'm shooting it's an aperture size and so that becomes already it gives you a, a signature it gives you a, a, um, a feeling of how your photographs are, are sort of going to come out so when i shoot portraits again i'm at 2.8 um 4.5 because I want to just get the eyes and the skin at the front and everything else I don't really care about. I want the story that mm. happens and all the background can just can just blur off and go somewhere else. And so, again, I think my style comes everywhere. And I try and do that with any of my Instagram pictures. So if I'm taking a picture with my phone, I stick it onto portrait. I've got an iPhone. I stick it onto portrait and I still do the F slidey up and downy on the phone. I'm carrying my camera work into my phone into my phone work so everything of mine is all very similar and I haven't really done that um forcefully it's just a, a natural thing that how I've how I've become and I think getting your style is either you can you, you look at some other photographers that you like look at the work of historical historic photographers or contemporary photographers and think well how did they take that photograph deconstruct someone else's photograph and study that photograph and think well how did they do that I like that how did they do that and then try and replicate it mm -hmm. and Lou let's have a look at your uh, favorite photo and also how you came to decide on what your style was uh, this is also a beauty, beautiful scenic shot. So this is in Marrakesh. Just the only re the reason why this is my favourite is because this was at the similar time of day as to the day at the time I walked the track every day. So I walked the track on the track because I was staying really close to it. And every day I saw the mountains and I was like, how wicked would it be to get a shot of the car during test? This was te the test, but the weekend early in the morning where the mountains are in focus or sort of in the background and you've just got this spotlight because again it's kind of very quite theatrical and this was the first run it's the first place I went to on the kind of test day like test days are sort of play days for me I'm like yay sort of just get cool, cool shots of the cars on track and stuff and um and I was like right I'm just gonna try and get this shot out of my head it's gonna be fine and then uh, this is Harry Tinknell in the Jag Jaguar he locked not only did he literally drive straight through that wonderful little spotlight he locked up in it as well which just makes everything look <laughs> so kind of much more dramatic so I just get kind of a cool silhouette and the the mountains and everything is quite atmospheric so um yeah um so my and style style what's your style my style is what what my heart says it's it's always been 
kind of like vision like visual things that kind of stick with me a lot of my first memories of motorsport are always visual kind of heat haze and stuff like that from watching formula one and stuff when i was a kid so i sort of just yeah i sort of go with what's what it, it kind of develops as ever, over the year as i kind of get used to sort of things but i always look at kind of images that i really love um i'm a massive fan of kind of documentary photography of landscape photography so if I can combine that into what I I love doing um and motorsport photography then I can create something really special I absolutely love kind of theatre theatre style photography it's part of my background but also it just makes everything look really dramatic and it's a way of showing sort of how much like the drama and everything and the, the paddock and the people just just love them so yeah. um, if I can make that into my images and that's great and I'm always trying to improve like I never think that that is quite hard to choose my favorite image because I don't, I think this might be my next one sort of thing. Like I, I can't yeah. stop. I can't always sort of favorite. go, oh, I've done it. Cause once I've done it, <laughs> there's no point now. Like, so yeah, it's always just adapting and, um, and getting to the point. And yeah, and just, and, and there are some shots that I used to absolutely love taking in the first year that I was doing stuff that I hate now. It's just about not being afraid to make mistakes to push yourself and to evolve as a person yeah. and as you evolve as you get older your photography will change embrace that that's okay you will by being yourself and true to what you love and what you visually connect with you will create your own style mm -hmm. you don't and have to kind of go with an instagram filter your own tastes might change style will change trends will mm -hmm. change um i've got uh, just well, i'll just quickly was so a few of the final questions um a question from Kaylee, uh, she would like to know, do you think there is an age where you can be too old to get into motorsport photography? No. No, photog you get better as a photographer as you get older. It's a, um, you, you get better and better and better and better and better. Every photograph you take will hopefully be better than the one you took yesterday. Um, so if you've chosen to start wanting to get into motorsport, start do it whenever age. If you decide to do um, animal photography, landscape photography, theatre photography, people, just just start whatever age you are, go for it. Um, you'll get better and better as, as the years progress. And as your grey hair grows, you'll get better and better. Um, and there's, <laughs> there there's, 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 there's no there's no age limit for photography. It's 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 brilliant. You just need to hold it. If you've got if you haven't got arthritis yeah <laughs> you're fine and again you know I think that what you see when you're 16 to what you see when you're 40 to what you see when you're 80 when you look through a lens is totally different so again you know what you might bring as if you're a little bit older will but just be a different look on things so Kaylee we expect to see you in a pit lane very soon with a camera in hand um I know I don't what age you are you're probably like 21 <laughs> um uh, we have a, another question. Um, any, what kind of camera and editing software would you recommend starting on? The best camera you have, it, it, the best camera you can get is the camera you have with you, firstly. So if you've only got a phone, they're pretty good these days. If you've only got a point and shoot or a film camera, I learned on film, there's no, that's. I photograph Le Mans with the, with the, with the phone. Um, I was working for Huawei and with the P20 Pro uh, camera on it and I shot Le Mans, all Le Mans with a phone. I didn't have a camera or anything. I just shot it with the phone. The pictures are on my website as a, as a Huawei gallery. Shot Le Mans with a phone. Uh, oh, yeah, the best, the best camera you've got is the one you have on you. Um, what else did you say? Oh, editing equipment. Yeah. Um, I use Lightroom. I use a bit of Photoshop, but only to, to, I don't really, I haven't used Photoshop for years, <laughs> um, but I use Lightroom and I, I love it. Um, there's other programs. It's really good to have a few editing programs. I shoot mostly what happens inside the camera. So I don't really do a lot of editing. I just do get everything looking straight um, make everything look in the same family. If, if it's been bright, dark, I want to keep everything of that shoot fairly similar. Um, 
I don't really put a lot of filters on things. I'm not one for filters, all those Instagram filters or other sorts of filters. I'm actually what is there in the moment. Um, so uh, I do like Lightroom for just keeping everything subtle, but Lightroom's got so many different functions. But there are, you have to pay for Lightroom, but there are other free free editing suites and it's good to have one. Um, that's that's my one, but what, what do you use, Liz? Uh, I use Lightroom as well. And I'm going to add in what I use before everything gets into Lightroom. So when I'm working for multiple clients, I'm working like trying to turn things around really quickly. I use a program called Photo Mechanic. Um, and there are loads of different uh, versions of Photo Mechanic, but I use Photo Mechanic. And I literally go through all of the images very quickly because I have to have a quick turnaround. So I'm going through and I'm assigning everyone a color or whatever. And I quickly go through and then I can just filter them through there. So that's how I get from, I don't know, 700 images for, four, for fp3 oh, and then all of a sudden my clients have them within half an hour from me getting back to the media center it's very very quick i go back through them at the end of the day and again after the weekend but to get them images and that turnaround really quickly i just very very quickly go through photo mechanic highlight them bring them into lightroom they get kind of an adjustment filter that i've already put on there just kind of like general kind of bam that's fine that's just my general tone like maybe slightly up the saturation or the contrast depending on the kind of cut the kind of day maybe a little bit of kind of texture or something if it needs to be very 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 quick export them to the clients so it, it can be very quick and then I go back through and I can do some more kind of acute editing but I don't do much because my camera and I'm sure lots of cameras at the moment have a has a wi-fi facility in it so you can send it straight to your phone or your computer or your portal your website portal mm -hmm. so my camera I can send it straight to my website without it touching my computer um, and it has all the metadata and all the information you need so if it was a bright sunny day and everything was hunky-dory and you don't need to do anything to it I just send it from my phone sit there and it goes straight to the website and then the client signs in to the website and takes the pictures out and I've not even gone away from the track. Brilliant, brilliant. I love it. So it's all the different ways of doing it. And I guess it's all, pers you know, it's dependent on who the client is and what the event is and what you're shooting. It's about finding the sort of the right, the best way of working on that particular job. Um, uh, actually, well, I, this is another question then from Anna. I think we've sort of um, covered that actually. She says, what's the main thing that you do with your images? once they've been taken and edited. Oh, once they have been taken and edited. Okay, so what do you do with them afterwards? <laughs> so once they're finished, um, I store them on a Drobo, which is a RAID system. It's, a, it's got five decks in it. Um, and if one drive breaks down, it gets rescued. So you're never gonna lose anything. It's a clever um, storage system rather than just having one disc and if that breaks you're you're you're, you're buggered and um, this has got five discs and it all sort of helps each other and if one breaks you're never going to lose anything so i store something on my drobo and then the other so the, the, the raw stays on my drobo and the jpegs or the tiffs go up to my website so i've got two places where they get stored um and my negatives i shoot film still my negatives live in masses of boxes mm. in my bedroom um, with the cat sits on top of them um, and a slowly one by one if, if, if they're needed for a book or something they all get scanned but otherwise I think about scanning them every now and then um, and then a lot of it goes off to Getty because I'm a Getty contributor um, so that's what happens the client takes the pictures directly from my website they have a password or they have a they're registered so everything's licensed and it goes straight to the client from my website I know exactly where every one of my pictures are they're not orphans they're all the client has it without a watermark otherwise it lives with the watermark on the internet somewhere yeah yeah okay and Lou what about you uh so mine is very similar kind of basically exactly the same backup system so oh. always have multiple backups <laughs> I have had when I was younger have drives fail on me I've had them fail recently but having a backup sort of says that um my clients get it depends where if they're clients from kind of a, a my, my kind of like my freelance perspective or whether they're from kind of the the agency that I work with 
uh, if it's with the agency that I work with, then they have their own galleries on their image distribution website. Um, and they all go up there throughout the whole weekend. And then I'll make sure that there's any kind of any other, other additional things kind of at the end of the weekend. Um, if it's like a smaller client or if it's just a one off thing, then I don't have galleries on my website probably should um but i will get around to that um <laughs> i often use kind of things like we transfer and things like that so i always make sure i have um a backup but um i don't host websites i don't host like galleries for clients just yet that's a work in progress that's like a thing i need to get to but but yeah um, and just there's another question from Ken. How do you see photography in motorsport developing in the next five years? Um, he says he feels like there's been nothing new as per se for some time now. Well, the, the thing is, photography has been going since late 1800s and progresses through its own technology it progresses internally there was gun by chromate cibachrome um vivex um film and we went to digital really bad digital really really bad digital then it went to good digital the digital's <laughs> getting quite good now the films have come and gone the films are still staying um, cameras have progressed there's mirrorless now so within photography itself it, it's progressed Motorsport has also progressed in its own way in the sense it was electric at the turn of the century. Then it went to the combustion engine. Then it went to, the, to, to hybrid and now it's back to electric. Um, so, and, and they, they used to be on the roads, then the circuits, mm -hmm. they're on roads again. Um, so progression happens in its own, in their own, in their own ways. Um, to get an innovative new photographer, um, it's, it's, it's a tricky one as well, because um, where you can stand as a press person to take photographs gets less and less and less. There's, there's lots more red corners. There's lots more places where you can't stand. Pit lanes are becoming far and far removed. You, you can't always stand where you wanted to. And there used to be loads of people standing on the roads, but now there's barriers and there's, so there's lots of challenges you just have to get someone to come along with their own eye. Lou's got the great panning, I do some cinematic shots. I think there's not ever gonna be something completely different, except you can have loads of lights and explosions happening. I think it's just each event is special in its own way. Mm -hmm. I think everything is progressing in their own way. Photography's progressing, motorsport's progressing, and occasionally you're gonna get people that are just gelling together. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I answered that or not. I think I think it's also dependent on the client. So, if, for example, if Formula One wants things to be very similar, and if teams are kind of going kind of with sort of maybe sort of their heritage look that they they've always had, then you don't have that photographer may have all these amazing ideas, but they may not have the opportunity to have them we're seeing at the moment some slight changes in formula one and the way that their social media over the last like three or four years is developing you've got kind of more kind of behind the scenes videos you've got more behind the scenes sort of stylized let's tell you a little bit more about the drivers let's get those kind of candid shots and stuff and i think that's coming in that's sort of mercedes are doing that a lot in formula e and formula one and and you have the same with mclaren in formula one there is movement there to get the fans sort of engaged and that's only come from 10 or 12 years of social media mm -hmm. so as the world changes the best thing that you can that you can do as a photographer is to stay on top of where the where the world is mm -hmm. formula one at the moment motorsport at the moment is very aware that it has an aging audience it has an aging audience of fans who know things in a certain way and it's not attracting the same volume of people as it was from younger generations and there is a really big push from teams to focus on that to look for different people to look for different photographers who may be in different series maybe doing different things um so i think it is going to change a lot in the next five years i think that will come with access that will come with <laughs> with people who are there it will it will come from inclusivity it will come from involving as many people as we can who haven't been given a voice before and listening to them and then we'll, and it will develop slowly so I can't tell you where it's going to go but that's a good thing I think because like, it's going to be really like 
it's going to be really interesting and exciting and I'm sort of hoping that I'll still be there riding that wave yeah when that I think each each race is each race is exciting I, I'm like a goldfish because each the beginning of every race you know the start of Le Mans you do you end up you, you do have tears in your eyes when it starts and you just think hang on but we were here last year oh no obviously not this year but yeah. year before and you think hang on but it happened already but we still don't know what's going to happen you know it's really exciting we just don't know what's going to happen and I think that makes the the excitement because you don't know when the sun's going to come down or the smoke's going to come through or someone's going to crash unfortunately or someone's going to have the different driver changes every piece it's it's, it's the same as photographing the theatre the theatre is, is in a stage set and every play is different but it's so exciting to watch it you're taken somewhere else and that's the beauty of each race I, that's why I love endurance racing because you just don't know the answer yeah. you don't know the result uh, but you do always somehow manage to be at the right place that's what I always love <laughs> you always know you always know where to be <laughs> and well guys we have slightly overrun but there were so many questions and I really wanted to get through them um so thank you both uh for talking through everything with us um hopefully everyone that's joined us has found the session very interesting um I'm sure Lou and Lara, you won't mind if anyone does need to get in touch with any sort of specific info, you'll be you'll happily be able to help. Um, and and also just sort of wrap up to wish everyone a wonderful Easter. Say a huge thank you to Girls on Track UK and Motorsport UK for organizing the event. And um, yeah, Lara Lou, you're awesome. Can't wait to see what you photograph next. <laughs> Take care, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.